people grow up now. And this is their first time being in a youth camp. And just to see them respond to the word of God, learn the lessons that are there. You know, it's like a, you know, it, it's taken, what, 15, 16 years now to see this. So they are now the young people. So thank God. They, they will be singing later on. You would see a whole group of them, and they will sing uh, a song. And there are lots of things they are learning. They're learning songs. They're learning the Lord's Word. They're learning to relate. They're learning to find faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many wonderful things to learn. And to see them respond. They, by the way, they raise really good questions. <laughs> really good questions. And it just shows how they really want to know this faith of their soul. Now, the other thing is, the young people that I was ministering to when I first began have become the young adults committee members, right? They are there as taking leave, I mean, seriously, and then being there the whole week, serving alongside, and literally doing everything. They do the program. I mean, mine is the luxury of just teaching the Lord's Word. They do the lead in the song. They plan the thing. It is absolutely wonderful. They will used to be the young people, finding faith, uncertain about their faith, and just to hear them lead the whole thing with confidence and certainty of faith was tremendous. It's like a full circle. It's to see like a full circle thing. And that brought great joy. To, to the heart to see this, right? And, and amazing to have a group like that and they are committed, they love the Lord and the way they speak about their faith with such certainty. The heart that they have to reach the young people, it was really, really special. Well, thank God for, for this. You weren't there, so I thought I'd just share this joy with you, everybody. Thank you for praying and, and asking how did the youth camp go? Well, really, thank, thank God that things went well. I have one here. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Right? And uh, uh, th thankfully, there's not too many people who fell sick as, as well. There were a few. Uh, they couldn't even come for camp. And uh, one of them was, uh, was Tim, and he was a musician that was meant to be a pianist. And then he fell sick. And that can happen. And so well, one and only, so Eldin did not only have to cook, she had to play the piano as well. That was, we didn't know how, how that was going to work out. Well, thank, thank God she was able to, that, you know, the Lord's strength and see, enabled her to see her through. But it was nonetheless challenging. You know, so as we speak about faith to the young people, that we had to find that faith and certainty in the Lord's promise of grace and strength to serve Him too. Right? So, well, thank God for His blessings poured out. Now, the coming week, the, the seniors will have their own retreat. And, and, and that will be something to look forward to. The focus, the theme is on discipleship. And we will open this up to all who are you know, seniors. And, or, or just, you, you don't have to be in the seniors program. You can, you can be there if you want to learn what, you know, a bit better of what discipleship is all about. Right? I must warn you ahead of time. It is, uh, you know, the, the focus is not food, is not singing, is no games, nothing. Just read the Lord's Word, study the Lord's Word, learn whatever we can and apply it into life. Because at a senior's level, we can't waste time. <laughs> no time to waste. Right? So we look forward to that too. Okay? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for grace given to us to serve you, to see the work of God continue in the next generation. We thank you for your blessings poured out, all the effort, resources that has been poured in has brought forth some fruit. And we pray that you would continue to bless the young people's ministry, to see another generation rise up to know the Lord Jesus, to love the Lord Jesus too. We ask that you would bless our time together. Help us to do our part as the senior generation, 
that to watch and to pray, to grow alongside, to learn alongside. We pray that you would bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that must be our commitment. We cannot have the young people learn and grow and then the adults in the church go backwards. Cannot. We have to learn alongside and grow alongside. Right? Well, let's take up uh, Matthew chapter 11. And we continue to read this. Now, this part is quite challenging. So we do have to compare, uh, investigate this a little bit further, deeper. Because some of the things that Jesus is saying, you'll be wondering, why, why is he saying what he says? Who is he addressing? Right? Now, in chapter 11, <clears throat> we see him address this present generation. Right Now, verse 16, and he says, But to what shall I liken this generation? Okay? What is this generation like? Right? So when we talk to, to people, we, this is the idea of a general feel for. He's not mentioning any people people in particular, but the general uh, idea, the general feel of how people are responding. Right? This, is, this is something that we do all the time. We have to assess where this current generation is going. And it is concerning. If I were to look at this present generation, right, man, it is really, really concerning to see where everything is. Now, let's take a look at uh, what the Lord Jesus says about this present generation. What shall I liken this generation? And then he uses an illustration. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you. You did not dance. We mourn for you and you did not lament. Right? They're not saying they are children. He is using an illustration. This is a kid's game. Yeah, right? And uh, if you ever play the game, the modern version will be Simon Says. Right? Simon Says, do this. Yeah, everybody does this. Yeah, Simon Says, put up your right hand. Everybody put up their right hand. And they put on your right that your hand, you're not supposed to put it down, right? We're familiar with the game Simon Says. Now, this is the ancient version. It's a child's game. And when the children call out to their companion, uh, they play the flute, you're meant to dance. And they pretend to mourn, you're meant to lament. Right? Children play games like that. They reflect the, 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 what, what's happening around them, but it's a game. Now, Jesus is using a very popular children's game to illustrate a point. <clears throat> when the children are calling out, but there are these children, when they play the flute, you did not dance. When they uh, meant to mourn, you did not lament. Right? They will always be you know, children that are just you know, part of it, they will be, they'll do, they'll, they'll follow the rules, but there will also be children they, they deliberately respond contrary. Now, I don't want to do it. You ask me to do it, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to respond. I'm going to sit there. You dance, I'm not going to dance. I'm not going to participate. There will always be some who are like that. And the Lord Jesus Christ is comparing this present generation to children that are not so well behaving. Right? The response is meant to be good. Now, play a flute, you dance. Nope. What are you going to do about it? Right? Wow, I do this. No, I'm not going to do it either. Now, that was the illustration used. What is the Lord saying over here? <coughs> okay? And there will be people who will always respond like this. They simply refuse to comply, right? They will respond in a very, very con 
contrary way. These are like spoiled kids who just want to do their own thing. You see spoiled kids, they don't, they just want to do their own thing. They are going to listen. So as parents, we have to be very, very careful how we bring up our children. Right? So uh, otherwise, they are going to not respond properly and, and they can choose whatever they respond, they respond contrary. Now, question is, who was the Lord Jesus talking about? Right? Now, let's read on further. Then there's the clue that is there. It's connected to verse 18. For John came eating, neither, sorry, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. Ah, that is very, very critical, very, very nasty. Right? So there was John the Baptist, and he came into the scene, and he didn't, now his, he has just such an intense ministry, he's either in the wilderness, and people don't see him eat very much. How does he sustain himself? And there were people who were saying these things. Oh, he has a demon. Right? You say things like that. There were people, that, this is called trying to damage another person's reputation. John had a good reputation. He is a preacher. He, he was a special messenger of the Lord. And there he was. But there were people in this Right? Among this generation, we see the multitude that were there. Who makes up the multitude that influences this generation? Now, there were people saying things. Right? Now, that's how it works. How do you influence a generation? Now, people will try to whisper here, say things about another person. So, they sp say these things about John. And John had a demon. Now, what did they say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Not very good things either. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Not that Jesus' focus was eating and drinking. He mingled with everybody. He was with the tax collectors. Right? Remember the story of Matthew? Uh, how Matthew came to know the Lord? Now, let's take it quickly to Matthew 9, just to refresh this. Right? When Matthew decided to follow Jesus, he threw a party, right? And invited a lot of people. Now, Matthew 9, watch this. Then, that many tax collectors, sinners came down, sat down with him and the disciples. Verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Identified Pharisee. Right? Now, do this comparative work. Now, check Matthew 11, this is the exact words that were used. And they will say, look, a glutton, a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. There you go. So when the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, who do I like in this present generation? What made up this present generation that was influencing the people this way? Now, Matthew 9 tells us, Pharisee. Right? Now, we take a look at Luke's gospel, and he is even a bit more specific. Luke chapter 7. <coughs> and verse 30. Right? You see Luke chapter... Oh, sorry. Uh, Luke chapter 7. Uh, Luke chapter 7. This is, a, this is the account that is written in Matthew 11. Same thing. Okay? But Luke points out who these people are. Right? So in Luke 7, okay, and then we read the uh, same thing here. Okay? Now, let's take a look at this. 
So when all the people heard it, verse 29, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with John, baptism of John. Right? So there were tax collectors coming, repenting of their sins. And John baptized them. And then these people were not too happy. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Right now, but they were there. Look at this. The Lord said, To what shall I liken the men of this generation? Now, there's your connection. Okay? Same thing. Uh, they are like children sitting in the marketplace. Same thing. This was written in Matthew 11. You see the connection? But Luke puts down who they are. The Pharisees, the lawyers. Right? Okay? And same thing. They say these things here. Uh, the John the Baptist came neither eating uh, bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating, drinking, and you say, look, he's a glutton, a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors. Look how nasty these things are. Now, these were the Pharisees and the lawyers. These were meant to, they, they were called teacher of Israel too. These are meant to be the people who were meant to encourage people to seek God, to find God real in their life, to live righteously. And they were saying these things. Very nasty spirit inside them. They're very legalistic. They're very nasty in their comments. Right? They didn't like John because he was baptizing a lot of people and the people were going to him. He didn't like the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he's associating with tax collectors, with sinners, and he called, tells people, this fellow is a wine bibber. He's a, you know, he just likes to go to people's house to drink, to eat their feast. And he's a friend of sinners. See, can't be anything good. Now, they have been doing it, whispering along the way. A very nasty, legalistic spirit. And so the Lord Jesus Christ brings this up. What do I like it about this generation? Can I tell you very openly, very honestly, what it is? Right? And they got to watch out. The disciples have got to watch out for this not-so-good spirit inside them. If, if they're not careful, they're going to be influenced by this present generation. The Lord Jesus Christ refused. You call me names, I call you names. He's not going to call names. He's not going to go into name calling. He will carry on faithfully helping people to know the kingdom of God, lead them to the kingdom of God. But we got to see this problem that I hear. It's sad, but that's where it is. Right? So a few weeks ago when I read the news, no, maybe last week, sorry, not a few weeks ago, last week read the papers about how now they have passed the bill, a law to protect the teachers from, not the students, from the parents of the students. There is a, there's a law to protect the teachers from the students. And I thought that's bad. Students can be very nasty, can be very abusive, towards the teachers, right? Now, there's a second thing that is passed now as law to protect the teachers from the parents. Parents who hurl verbal abuse, who swear and curse and threaten teachers. You look at it, what has this present generation becoming? So I talked to Enoch because he's a teacher. I said, is this true? that parents will do things. He tells me, every day I get threatened. But good thing he's so big, you see. I, wouldn't, I, would, I, would, I don't know why you're thinking to threaten somebody like you not. Right? So, uh, and, and it's sad. On the news we're saying, looking at all these things, and they're saying, we don't have enough teachers. Why would you want to be a teacher? If this is happening, Right? It's so hard to fix a generational problem. We all often think, okay, policies, this, that, and the other thing. They are good. They help. 
But we are talking about a generational problem. That is difficult. Right? It comes from parents. You look at why the, the, how come the students can be so nasty, kids can be so nasty to curse and swear and threaten teachers. It can come from parents. The parents are just like that. Now there's a law to protect the teachers from the parents, which to me is absolutely amazing. Well, thank God for laws. This is why laws are good in that sense. They come in to protect. Without laws, you're going to have less teachers. There's no protection for the teachers. Right? So, same, Enoch, I spoke to all our teachers, Tim, uh, Enoch, uh, didn't get a chance to talk to Tamara, but the two boys, yep, that's what it is. Parents will actually threaten the, the teachers. Where, what kind of what kind of, what does that say to the children? What do we teach the next generation? Do you see the problem? Now, you have people like, they are the lawyers. They are the Pharisees. They are the custodians of the scriptures. They are meant to, the, the idea of a Pharisee is meant to be righteous. This is self-righteousness. This is very nasty, Right? what they say about John, and what they say about the Lord Jesus Christ. You mustn't think the Lord Jesus doesn't know what's happening. He just teaches Bible faithfully, and He doesn't know what's going on. He knows exactly what people are saying against Him. Right? He brings it up. He addresses it. I'll tell you why you say these things. Now, look how He comments. This is very profound. Okay, now look at what the Lord Jesus Christ says. It's very, very profound. It's the same in Luke and Matthew. He says, but wisdom is justified by all her children. <coughs> now, this is interesting. If you go to Matthew 11, it's the same uh, verse, the same idea. Right? Uh, wisdom is justified by her children. Now, what, what is this? Wisdom. Is justified by her children. So there are. Uh, in that sense. Children. Of wisdom. Right. Wisdom is justified by her children. The book of Proverbs promotes wisdom. Okay? Look, take a look at this uh, book of Proverbs part of it, and then we perhaps understand this uh, a little bit better. This whole idea of uh, children of wisdom. <clears throat> okay, in Proverbs, we see, uh, uh, take a look at this whole idea of wisdom. Okay, now the first part of it uh, is Solomon's writing of the idea of how to know wisdom and instruction. Take a look at verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the open square. Right? There is wisdom, and this is what wisdom say. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Proverbs chapter 1 and then verse 20. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refuse. I stretch out my, uh, my hand. You regard, you don't, no one regarded, you disdain my counsel, right? And would have none of my rebuke. Now, this is like as if wisdom personified. This is wisdom, God's wisdom speaking, okay? And, and she says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm, your destruction like a whirlwind when distresses and anguish 
uh, come upon you. Then you will call on me, I will not answer. You will seek me diligently. Too late, you will not find me. Because they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord, they, have, they would have none of my counsel. They despise my every rebuke, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way. This is sad, where people, for the longest time in their life, keep on rejecting knowledge of God, they keep on rejecting the fear of God, they keep on rejecting the counsel of God, and when they are in serious trouble, they're not going to find it. There is a too late. Now, this is the warning that wisdom gives. They will eat of the fruit of their own way. They will be filled with their own fancy. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. Complacency of fools. Now, that's the problem. They were very complacent. Whoever listens to me will dwell in safety and will be secure without fear of evil. Right? Now, this is like wisdom. This is like a mother. Wisdom is described here as a woman speaking to her children. Are they truly children of wisdom? How do you can tell by their response? Right? If they are truly children of wisdom, they will not respond like that. They will not be like spoiled kids responding contrary to everything. They will not hurl such nasty remarks at people like that. Given they are special servants of God, there is no regard, no respect that comes from them. If they are children of wisdom, they will not speak like that. They obviously are not. Right? Now, let, let's take a look at that. Okay? Chapter 2, this whole idea of wisdom calling out is important. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you would incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. This is why some people will discover the joy of knowing the Lord, and some don't. Because simply they don't try. They don't search for her as treasure. They don't seek it with all their heart. Wisdom. Right? So this is wisdom. Then they will understand these things. Verse 6, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Verse 7, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Wisdom is like a shield that will protect you from evil. It is like a, it is like some, uh, like a shield that will guard your path too. He guards the path of justice, preserves the way of His saints. It will guard you, it will protect you, it will preserve you. Verse 9, then you will understand. Again, understand. All right? You will understand, you will find knowledge, you will understand. Now, let's take a look at uh, this thing here. You would understand righteousness, justice, equity, every good path. Did the Pharisees and the lawyers understand righteousness, equity, every good path? No. Look at it. How could it be possible if they are going to speak like that, say things like that, and think they get away? Right? How do you know they are truly children of wisdom? By their response. <clears throat> Anyone can claim anything. What are they really like? Now, take, take a look at this. Verse 10. When wisdom enters your heart, 
right? What will happen? One, knowledge is pleasant to your soul. Now, that's what I ask. Is knowledge of God pleasant to my soul? Right? It's not, okay, I, I, I think I already know. It's pleasant to you. Two, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. From the man who speaks perverse things. From those who will leave the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Right? So there are people who have left the way of uprightness. They speak perverse things. Say, no, again, by what they say, you can tell. They are not children of wisdom. Children of wisdom will not speak perverse things, for starters. They are not going to do things that are evil to other people. Now, they are, these are all things, right? Now, these people, they delight in perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and who are devious in their path. Now, there we go. They hide among the multitude. So when the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching, the Pharisees and the lawyers were actually there, blending in the crowd, listening, not because they want to learn. They are whispering this, whispering that, saying all kinds of things, hoping to damage the reputation, hoping to turn another person aside. Now, this is got to, to be identified carefully. Right? So when the Lord Jesus Christ said, wisdom is justified by her children, that's a big hint for the lawyers. Now, they are lawyers because they are trained in knowing the laws of God. These are not secular lawyers. They should take a leaf and be remembered about Proverbs and, and remember Proverbs. Are they children of wisdom as they boast and claim themselves to be? This was a warning to them. They are not. And if they keep on going at it, they will destroy themselves. Now, this is Proverbs 1, Proverbs chapter 2. Right? Okay? So these are really, really challenging things for them to consider. Okay? Right. Um, does that help us to understand this text? So when we read Matthew 11, you've got to ask yourself, who is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about? Otherwise, we won't understand who is He talking about. The multitude, this present generation. Things can't be that bad, right? What, what were, why were they saying things like that? Now, the Lord Jesus, some of the gospel writers identifies who they are. Okay? So we've got to watch out for these things here. The, the influence, uh, this is why Jesus told his disciples concerning, uh, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven you know, can corrupt the whole, whole thing, just a little bit. This is the spirit of the Pharisees and the lawyers. It's a very nasty, a very you know, legalistic, a very critical, a very judgmental spirit got to watch out for these things. Don't catch this spirit. Right? Children, the, the generation, what is this generation like? You can end up becoming like that. Okay? So when we, when we teach the children, we teach them to respond. We teach them to respond appropriately. Alright? By all means, ask questions. But ask respectfully. But ask with your, because you want to learn. And we're well aware that if, if we don't, that the generation that raise up, you know, we have to teach them lots and lots of things. Some of the children, we have to teach them to share. Okay, well, one boy came and he wanted to take all the food, everything. He wanted to eat everything. You have to stop. You can't. We have to teach some of these things here. The, the young, young ones. The older ones are fine. But they're little ones, and they will catch on. Right? Whether you teach by way of telling them or you teach by way of example. 
You know, okay, well, thank God for the committee members who are there and you know, the way they serve, what they said, the way they love, the way they cared, the way they have given of themselves fully to the work of the Lord at camp. Some of the young ones spoke a lot about them. They said they were just so inspired by the camp officers. And, and thank God for that. Good. They may not understand everything about the message. That's fine. But they were inspired by them. I, I'm, I'm very, very glad. Very, very glad. But that's what it is. The, the, this, our influence can affect the generation. And we've got to watch out that we have the right spirit, the spirit of Christ, rather than the wrong spirit that is obviously there. Okay? All right. Um, any questions you want to raise up uh, over here? Right, so you read Matthew 11, it's not so clear. You've got to compare it with Luke 7. Then it becomes very clear who these people there uh, were saying all these things. Right? So the Lord Jesus Christ had to address them. Now, next, next week, uh, Pastor Charlie will be here. Uh, he will be teaching uh, uh, di- different. It will be different. So when we come back the next time when I am uh, able to teach you again, we will take up a series of declarations the Lord made were not so good. Whoa! They were very strong words against. Right? So we have to look at these challenging things too. We really have to look at these challenging things. So one of the messages I shared with the young people is God divinely warns us. That's what happened to Noah. God divinely warned Noah. How did Noah respond? With godly fear. And because he did, now he was honored among those in Hebrews 11 as men of faith, by faith. Being divinely warned, he responded with godly fear. He was able to save not just himself, but his whole household in building the ark. And they were those who did not respond with godly fear. They sneered at the warning of God and they perished in the flood. Well, that, these are lessons to be learned as well. Don't sneer at the warning of God. Right? God warns us. Wisdom itself warns us. This is uh, Proverbs chapter 2. Because you despised because you rejected because then you will eat the fruit of your own doing. These are all divine warning that we must heed. Okay? Right, any, anything you want to raise up? Anything, questions at all? Uh, go ahead, uh, Josh. Um, yeah. yeah. Press this one too. This one too. <laughs> um, this morning we're talking about the, about the wisdom um, in what the um, the proverbs of wisdom. Yeah, proverbs. Yep. How do we deter the, the wisdom of the world and ah, the wisdom good. of the world? Very good question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate that. How do we, because the world, the, we, we talk about wisdom, right? The question is, how do we uh, distinguish, isn't it? What is wisdom that comes from the world? What we call secular wisdom, man's wisdom. Okay, Paul distinguishes, James distinguishes, right? And the wisdom that is truly from God. Right? That's the question? Good. Well, let's take a look at uh, first Paul's, uh, we look at Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians, and then we will take a look at James as well. Okay? The Corinthian church faced many problems, and part of the problem was the whole idea of secular wisdom coming into the church. And they couldn't distinguish between God's wisdom and man's wisdom. So Paul had to to write to them, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Right? Now, let's take a look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So the context here is that of wisdom. 
they were so enamored with the wisdom of the world, right? In, in terms of eloquence of speech, uh, you know, they were able to speak very well, articulate very well, skillfully say things. Now, without much real substance from the Word of God. And so Paul says to them, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Brethren, I came to you. I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Not that he had no wisdom. He is not going to employ man's wisdom, right? The strategy to get people in church, the strategy of church growth. You hear things like that? How to grow your church from 30 to 300 in one month. You've got to be kidding, right? You have things like that. There are all kinds of strategy, marketing strategy. Now, look at what Paul is saying. He is not going to employ anything like that. His focus is, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the gospel. And then he says to them, right? I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. My uh, speech, my preaching were not of persuasive words of human wisdom. Do you see that, uh, Josh? Yeah, there's your distinguish. Human wisdom. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. He is very clear here. Not human wisdom, not wisdom of men. Your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the, really in the power of God. What wisdom does he offer? Verse 6, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age or this generation, but not of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, the Pharisees and the lawyer instigated the crucifixion of Jesus. Obviously, they did not have the wisdom of God. If they did, they would have recognized Jesus straight away. They would have understood, they would have feared Him. They obviously didn't. Right now. <coughs> it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor the things that have entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the, wisdom, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? You are limited. Human wisdom cannot understand the deep things of God. Obviously, it takes the spirit of God to reveal the things of God to man. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. We have received not the spirit of the world, not human wisdom, nor human uh, your understanding, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. Verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is why I compare tags, Matthew and Luke, we compare a spiritual text with a spiritual text to understand the things of God, right? We have references from the Scriptures. You don't take a scholarly article somewhere and try to explain the Bible. What use is that? What use is that? Compare spiritual with spiritual, right? Now, the natural man does not receive the things that are of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. The natural man, meaning the person who has not been saved, the person who has not been regenerated, who doesn't have the Spirit of God, 
They are foolishness to him. They don't understand the things of God as wise. Right? Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They are not spiritually discerning. Now, but he who is spiritual judges all things. Now, there we go. Okay? Uh, he himself is rightly judged by no one. How can a, a person who... And this happens. You have people who are secular. You have people who are non-Christian believers. They judge the church for what they do. How does that work? And they tell the church, you can do this, you can't do this, you can do this. Excuse me? How does that work? They have been doing that since the day of Paul. They've been doing that. How can a person that is not of God think this is how God's church work and how God's work work? You can't, obviously. This is what Paul's arguing. For who has the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You want to instruct the Lord? But we have the mind of Christ. This is not boasting in the saying that we have the mind of Christ just like Christ. But we can understand what the Lord is thinking about, His reasoning, the way He thinks, because we have the Spirit of God given to us to appreciate spiritual things. This is where Paul is coming from. Right? Distinguish. Very clear. Right? Now, Paul is a really astute scholar. So this is how he writes. He makes a very strong argument for these things here. Now, in a very practical way, how do we see it in layman terms? Okay, now this is where we come to the book of James. And you need the both. We, we really need the both. The book of James is very helpful here. <clears throat> okay, now, let's take a look at the, the book of James. And, and James, well, the first chapter talks about praying for wisdom, uh, asking for it with faith and understanding. Right? Now, then we come to chapter 4 to take a look at this whole idea of, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 3, not chapter 4. Um, verse 13, chapter uh, 3. Okay, it's, it's, we all need wisdom. <laughs> we really do. So James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay, and so pray with faith with, that the Lord will give you wisdom. Proverbs challenges us, we must seek it like silver and gold. Then we will have the knowledge of God, therein comes wisdom, right? Now, here uh, James distinguishes between wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. In James chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, this is like what Jesus is saying. Remember, uh, the children are justified by wisdom, isn't it? Okay, the whole idea there, how do you tell? Now, let him show by good conduct and his works are done in meekness and wisdom. You want to see a person who has the wisdom of God inside them? One, they have good conduct. Two, they will do, his works are done with meekness of wisdom. Let's start off with that. In other words, you can tell by their actions, their response, their words, right? Now, verse 14, but if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. Obviously not from God, in other words. This is earthly, sensual, even demonic. It's not just man. The evil one is involved. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Verse 17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, p 
peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. This is the idea of submission. Submission to the Lord, mutual submission to each other in humility. Willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Right? So we have two texts, 1 Corinthians text and James text to help us see wisdom that is of the world and wisdom from God, not the same thing. Does that help, Josh? Okay? Right? As clear as clear can be. I, I use this list, it's very, very clear. Right? So there are people who are there and they say they're like scholars, they're very intelligent, they know their Bible very well and they're very nasty. Sorry, that wisdom is not from God. That's not from God. If you really know God, as you say you know God, the fruits will tell too. It's not what you claim, it's what you really are. And what you say, what you do, will give it away. A simple test the Lord Jesus always tells His disciples, by their fruits, you will know. False and true teachers of God. Okay? Good. Appreciate that question, Josh. Uh, any, any other questions that anyone want to raise up and point out? Yeah? That's a good, good question. And, and let's keep learning these things and, and that let it be something that we want to pursue with all our heart, the wisdom that is from God. As we're learning, what wisdom are we glean, gleaning from the Lord Jesus Christ? What wisdom are we obtaining that is from God? It would change the way we live our life. Right? Not bitter envy, not, not, not nasty remarks. All those things were there in the Pharisees. They were very, very nasty people. Speaking like that. Right? The Lord Jesus is not going to be like that. But of course. Well, let's follow Christ. And that's what it means to be His disciples too. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that You would help us to be aware that such human wisdom exists. And they're not from You. The evil one is part of the influence of the wisdom of man. And we pray that You would help us seek the wisdom that truly comes from you, that we may know you, fear you, love you, and display the fruits that would reflect your wisdom, gentleness, meekness, discernment, righteous, true righteousness, and more. We ask that you would hear this our prayer and work in our heart that we will seek the wisdom that comes from you. We pray for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.